When we drink from a public fountain like this, we take it for granted the water is safe. Well, over 100 years ago in 1854, over 500 people died from a well like this at Golden Square in the center of London, England. All of the victims lived within a few blocks of the well. The well was only a few feet from a sewer pipe. It was a London physician, John Snow, who figured out the connection between the sewer pipes, the well, and the disease. And once he convinced the authorities to remove the pump handle, forcing people to get their drinking water elsewhere, the cholera epidemic in that neighborhood ended. It was one of the first times in human history that an epidemic ended because someone figured out how to stop it. To better understand our toxic waste problems today, let's look at a little history. What were toxic waste problems like in the past? When and how did human beings first learn to understand and to control them? We'll start our survey with the Roman Empire some 2,000 years ago. Among other assorted ills, epidemics, and wars, there was chronic lead poisoning in many cities of that time and place. The lead came from cooking utensils, especially wine-making vats. Some historians think the long-range effects of the lead poisoning, which affects the brain particularly, was one of the major causes of the fall of the Roman Empire around the year A.D. 400. Well, today we tend to think of toxic wastes as chemical poisons like lead, mercury, arsenic, PCB, plutonium, and other radioactive waste. Poisonous though these chemicals may be, there is another class of toxic waste that are far more dangerous than poisonous. These are the toxic waste produced by living bacteria and viruses. These are the poisons that maim and kill under names like cholera, rabies, yellow fever, smallpox, polio, botulism, measles, malaria, and AIDS. Between 592 and 594, over one-third of Europe died from this kind of toxic waste. That's one out of three people on a whole continent. This toxic waste was made by a bacteria that was carried from rats to fleas to people. In every case, the poison from this bacteria, once it got into the human body, had the same devastating effect. The stricken person would go pale and start shivering. Scarlet blotches and black boils would quickly appear. Fever would rise rapidly. The patient would become delirious and in a few hours would be dead. It was called the Black Death. The same Black Death and other equally widespread epidemics of other germ-caused diseases made many people think the world was going to end in the year 1000. Now well, the world didn't end. But in the middle of the 14th century, once again, over a third of the people of Europe died in another outbreak of the Black Death. In the 15th century, a terrible syphilis epidemic spread throughout Europe, killing, blinding, and maiming millions of people. To get a better idea of just how catastrophic these poisons have been in the past, consider some numbers. When Newton retreated to his country home to discover the laws of motion in 1665, he left behind the Great Plague of London, a plague that killed 68,000 people in three months. That is 68,000 people out of a total population of 400,000. If a similar catastrophe were to strike New York, Los Angeles, or Chicago today, the death toll in one summer would be over a million people in each city. So far, I have mentioned examples in Europe only. Moving to Asia or South America or Africa, and the death tolls get worse. Terrible though the wars of history have been, the terror, misery, suffering, and death brought by toxic wastes have always been even more catastrophic. Lest you think all this was the long, long ago and the far, far away, the good old days of 19th century Europe and America were not much better. We know today that the smoke from factory stacks or the liquids from factory sewers are threats to our health. In the 19th century, however, there were few cities that did not publish advertising posters proudly exaggerating the black smoke belching from their booming factories. 
They considered the smoke a sure sign of progress. What they didn't show was the appalling amount of raw sewage, garbage, and filth that littered the streets of every city and village in America. They didn't show the children competing with the pigs for food in the garbage heaps. They didn't show the thousands of poor people who lived in tiny windowless rooms with such a lack of air circulation that over 3,000 died in one heat wave in New York City in 1896. Smaller frontier towns in the West were no better. In places like Helena, Montana, for instance, the hitching posts for horses quickly turned into filthy cesspools. And the advertising posters didn't show the chemical poisons mixed up in all that factory smoke the cities were so proud of. A Hungarian visitor to Pittsburgh in those days described the industrial smoke as, quote, a noisome vomit killing everything that grows, trees, grass, and flowers. The disease called rickets was especially common in all the industrial cities and towns of Europe. Now rickets is caused by a lack of vitamin D. Your body can make vitamin D so long as it is exposed to enough sunlight. Well the rickets in Europe in those days was caused by the blocking of sunlight in the cities and villages by the factory smoke. In the early 19th century, this is how one visitor described a small industrial town in Germany where the sky was darkened continually by the factory smoke. The children must sit indoors, which ends in death, or if they continue to live, they develop thick joints, cease to be able to walk, and have deformed legs. The head becomes large, and even the vertebral column bends. It comes to pass that such children sit often for many years without being able to move. At times, they cease to grow and are merely a burden to those about them. Food and water supplies were especially vulnerable, and they were tainted with many toxic chemicals and disease-causing germs. Unscrupulous vendors and manufacturers were even known to deliberately add toxic substances to bread, candy, and milk, and to the first canned goods in order to make them look better or last longer. Even when honest, food markets exposed raw meat and fish for days on end to the dust and dirt of the streets, making for dangerous dinners. And then there was poisoning from drugs. Alcoholism was extremely common. Jacob Rees counted 111 Protestant churches below 14th Street in New York versus 4,065 saloons. In Chicago, near Jane Addams Hull House, there were nine churches and 250 saloons. Morphine, heroin, and opium addiction were very common. Infants were fed Winslow's baby syrup and Cop's baby friend, both of which were liberally spiked with morphine. Heroin was marketed as a cough medicine in 1898. The result of all this toxic binge was what you might expect. Epidemics, poisonings, malnutrition, and drug addiction. The good old days, in other words, were only good in relation to the worse old days of medieval or ancient times. Was there no progress then? And are our problems today minor ones? Well, of course there was progress in the past, and no, our problems today are far from minor. The point of this fast trip through history is to put problems like this into perspective and more important, to take heart and to learn from success stories of the past. To understand the success stories, remember there are two kinds of toxic waste. One, the toxic waste generated by disease-causing organisms like cholera, black death, botulism, syphilis, as well as those produced naturally by plants, molds, and fungi. And two, the toxic waste generated by human activities, like the chemicals in pesticides, factory smoke, landfills, automobile exhausts, and sewage systems, or more deadly than any of these today, the toxic waste ingested into the body by smoke from cigarettes, cigars, and pipes. The first big success in the fight against nature-produced toxic waste came from the work of a country doctor in England around the time of the American Revolution. Edward Jenner learned how to use one toxic waste 
to destroy another toxic waste. Jenner learned to prevent a serious disease, smallpox, by vaccinating people with the germs of a much milder disease, cowpox. Now the immediate practical result, an astonishing victory over one of humankind's most dreadful scourges was important enough. But Jenner's work provided, in addition, the model for the future elimination of a hundred other germ-caused diseases. The vaccination model said, inoculate the person with a small amount of a toxic substance, or the microorganism able to produce the toxic substance. This inoculation will stimulate the human body itself to produce antitoxins. You see, antitoxins are chemicals that will fight and neutralize the poisons. In this way, the body will develop immunity to future doses of the same or similar toxic substances. Using that model, scientists to follow, giants like Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, Ignace Semmelweis, Walter Reed, Alexander Fleming, and Jonas Salk, gave us the knowledge and the technology needed to conquer rabies, typhoid, diphtheria, whooping cough, childbed fever, polio, and a thousand other infectious diseases. Essential to that winning battle was the chemical industry. With increasing knowledge of atoms and molecules, chemists began to custom make chemicals that could produce miracles. Paul Ehrlich in Germany discovered a specific chemical. They called it a magic bullet that could cure the dreaded disease syphilis. His arsenic bullet was the beginning shot in modern chemotherapy. Since then, researchers have found many more health bullets, that is, chemicals that can purify water, kill germs, and hasten sewage treatments. Chemicals that can preserve food, cure ailments, prevent tooth decay, and counteract toxic chemicals. Chemical drugs, new vaccines, and hard-working researchers could not do the job alone, however. Equally important in the fight for a healthy environment were thousands of not-so-well-known engineers, politicians, early environmentalists, and concerned citizens. These were the pioneers who alone and together, all over the country and all over the world, gradually put together the pieces of modern community health programs. The early 19th century pioneers were called sanitarians. They were the pioneers who created the world's first sanitation systems, garbage collection systems, safe water supplies, laws to restrict animals in the city, laws to control food and drug production, and pollution controls on factory and home, and most important of all, education for community and individual health. Sometimes the very effort to control these toxic wastes led to remarkable advances in science and technology. James Watt's invention of the steam engine, for instance, launched the Industrial Revolution and changed the world. What people often forget is that Watt and other pioneer engineers were trying to find a way to get rid of the toxic water that seeped into early coal mine shafts. Toxic waste problems, in other words, led to economic progress. These new public health laws and systems have worked remarkably well in changing human history. Today, in the industrialized world, disease epidemics are rare. When they do come, they can usually be stopped with minimal suffering and loss of human life. This does not mean, of course, there is no cause for concern today. The recent AIDS epidemic is the most sobering example that science is not all-powerful. So too the SARS scare, mad cow disease, and recurrent flu epidemics in this country and around the world. Safe water supplies are now the rule rather than the exception. The gross pollution of the 19th and early 20th century, in other words, has been brought under control in the industrialized world of North America, Europe, and Japan, that is. In many of the poorer countries of Asia, Africa, and South America, many of these same battles for sanitation are still being fought, and they're being slowly won. 
Does that mean that the toxic waste challenges are disappearing from our world? Far from it, they have changed. Where once nature and our own ignorance led to entire cities being wiped out by bubonic plague, or disfigured by smallpox, or poisoned by foul air and water, today we have to be concerned about the subtle, long-range effects of chemicals we never heard of before. Chemicals that in many cases never existed before. Chemicals like plutonium, and PCBs, dioxin, or chemicals that were there, but we never knew they were there, or nor had any way of detecting them, like minute amounts of metal ions and the slow buildup of acids in the air. Or by the buildup of an unusual chemical, sometimes waste, but sometimes life-giving, carbon dioxide. It is life-giving to plants since they need it to produce all of our food. It's a dangerous waste if it builds up too much in the atmosphere to lead to global warming in coming decades and centuries. And perhaps most worrisome of all, modern-day terrorists threaten our cities and countryside with chemical or biological warfare that may be difficult to defend against. But like the other challenges we have faced in the past, doable. For remember, the success stories of the past were always a blend of science and action. Science to identify the problem, cholera coming from a polluted well, action to do something about it, remove the pump handle so people don't use the well. Heartened by the courage and eventual success of our ancestors, let's turn to our modern toxic waste problems and opportunities in the second part of this program.